And action. Welcome to the Action Podcast, episode four. And today, because of the new Jurassic Park film coming out, we are going to be reviewing the classic original Jurassic Park. And today, my guest with me, uh, as always, is my brother, Peter Skarsiga. Uh, we have Dominique Diaz, who I went to high school with. And below is, is Rose. And Rose and I went to, uh, uh, worked at uh, Value Tainment together. And uh, yeah. Rose and I always had good film talk. So uh, oh, yeah. we're excited to have her on. Well, uh, like I mentioned, Welcome. we're, we're watching, uh, 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 we watched Jurassic Park which is directed by Steven Spielberg, written by Michael Crichton, who wrote the book and then wrote kind of the beginning part of the screenplay. And then uh, David Kep took over the writing duties and finished the screenplay. And he also wrote Spider-Man and Mission Impossible, if you're not familiar with his name. The film starred Sam Neill, Jeff Goldblum, and Laura Dern. And uh, yeah, the reason why, again, the reason why we're watching this film is, is, is to obviously get in the mood for the new Jurassic Park that's coming out. And then you know, for me, this was, um, you know, I was about uh, 13 years old when this film came out. And I vividly remember, you know, at, at this time, you didn't hear a lot of like movies pre-production wise, especially in that era. Uh, but this book, uh, first we heard about this book, that Michael Crichton book uh, that was coming out with a dinosaur book and that Steven Spielberg was attached to direct. And I, and I totally remember that, like hearing those headlines. And it was just like, whoa, Steven Spielberg's doing a, a dinosaur film like. You know, he had, he had just done, uh, uh, I mean, he, he had already done E.T., he had already done uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And so, you know, there's nobody better to take on this project than Steven Spielberg with his uh, imagination, his ability to tell story, move cameras, the whole nine. So I just remember being super excited uh, to see this. I mean, I saw it in theater, uh, saw it in the theaters and you know again with the sound and everything this was just uh an excellent movie to watch uh and yeah but let's go to uh let's go to dominique first dominique why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience first watching jurassic park you know similar to yours you know we're the same age we grew up together and i also remember those same headlines um i also remember the hype surrounding you know the new cgi technology that they were going to be using incorporating the dinosaurs into it yeah. um i remember vividly going to our hometown movie theater to see it um, man six yep man good old man six give it a shout out my husband used to work there RIP, <laughs> RIP, man six. Six. Man six. That's man right. six the, man six was the best yeah yeah it was so good and then you go to round table next door right after yeah. good times mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I remember, you know, seeing it on the big screen, what a movie is supposed to make you do, feel all the feels, right? And I'll never forget the scene where they roll up in the Jeep and they see the Brachiosaurus and their expressions. And, you know, my expression was the same as a 13-year-old kid in the movie theater. Yeah, it's like the first time you really saw a dinosaur. Like, we all witnessed seeing kind of dinosaurs live for the first time because nobody had ever mastered. Absolutely anything remotely looking like all, all we've seen is drawings really true and i think you know if you're going to talk about like wildlife other than like real wildlife like maybe with spielberg doing jaws like the epicness of the shark right. was kind of the closest thing in my opinion to that at that time yeah but i feel like you know jurassic park just put it over especially with like i said in terms of just making it look so real yeah absolutely rose what about you i know you were probably born in 1993 uh <laughs> no, I was born after. I wasn't even born with this movie. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. when, when was the I first was time? 95. Yeah, when, when, when did you actually first see this film? Actually, the first uh, thing I remember about this film is not actually the film. It's the ride in Disney. Oh, okay. So I remember Jurassic Park because of the ride and because of the song. So when I saw this movie, I was little, super little. So right now that you told me, hey, we're going to talk about Jurassic Park. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to rewatch the movie. Man, wow. Like now that I have a little bit of knowledge of what that movie is and the history of film. Wow. It, it was just amazing for a 1993 movie. Yeah. But um, I think 
it's one of the greatest movies and it 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 it, it had like i think it was the same time as a star wars star wars kind of so uh, we had that the new ones the it, it, it's in between the 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 first three and the the yeah the prequels. So, so the CGI and the well, I, I don't think that it, it was CGI um, most of it, but um, the new technology. This film, this film gave George Lucas the confidence, like the advancement of CGI at this point gave George Lucas the confidence that okay, like we can go ahead and start going on the prequels because he he always Voila. that was a big reason why they, they didn't happen like right away was he just the, the te- he wanted better technology and so yeah, well. Then you, you see it's like a, they they marked an era or or opened the doors for something and yeah, so they this did. is this is definitely probably the first major successful CGI film that, that yeah. really incorporates everything. Pete, Absolutely. what about yourself? You were a little That's bit older. True. Absolutely, yeah, a little bit older. <laughs> but you can combine all three of you together and you get me. <laughs> so yeah, you know, seeing this film for the first time was was iconic for sure. Uh the music. Um, like you were speaking of was was just so powerful and it really just kind of brought you into the movie and 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 kind of let you on that journey and kind of propelled you forward but you know my my appreciation for this movie came a lot later on uh I'm in animation if you two ladies didn't know so like animation is like what I I'm that's that's my job and so studying the history of Pixar and how they developed the technology and the years and years and years of of trial and turmoil and and, and pain and suffering just to get this first movie Toy Story made. You know, at the time Jurassic Park was coming out, um, Steven Spielberg wanted to use, um, what are they called? Robo? Animatronics? Animatronics, thank you. He wanted to use animatronics for this whole movie and it just wasn't working out. And the technology for that Pixar was developing wasn't actually ready for a full-time movie, like a 90-minute movie. And so I believe, and if I'm wrong, you know, people can punch me in the face, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure that Pixar sold the technology to Lucasfilm and they were able to utilize it for this film specifically. And I think that's how um, like yeah. that Pixar technology was actually introduced into sort of the mainstream world. And I remember seeing it and the first time you see a dinosaur back then, I mean, now you can tell that the the CGI isn't the best like it is today, but man, sure. back then it looked oh. real and it looked yeah. amazing. And you felt like you were it was inside. Epic. You felt like you were inside that world. And if not, you wanted to be there for sure. Totally. Yeah. A great movie. Yeah. And, and, and oh go ahead, Donnie. I was just going to say, and also, you know, being a mom to a little boy, I read something somewhere that said, you know, most about dinosaurs when you're four years old and when you have a four year old. Right. (laughs) And like, no, and like nowhere in between. And yet this is like, you know, I'm geeking out again, watching it, just like Rose mentioned, I watched it again just because it's been a while. Right. Yeah. And I'm I'm still geeking out at it at, you know, almost 42 as I did when I was 13. And so it's like that they they created that love for the dinosaurs that I might have lost when I was four or yeah. until I had my own four year old. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah. um, again, going back to like Spielberg being the right guy, uh, even even today, I, I think a big reason why this movie still holds up is he had that perfect balance of. CGI and practical animatronics, you know, mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, he had certain mm-hmm. shots that were tight, that would be the animatronics. And then the wider shots would typically be the CGI ones. But it's that balance, I think, because, because I, I think a lot of filmmakers, including Spielberg himself, you know, like, this is it's a big reason why a lot of people didn't like Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skulls was just, he got so reliant, same as George Lucas, so reliant on CGI that they lost, you know, a little bit of their filmmaking ways. Whereas here they specifically, again, they had, they had a, a formula of how they wanted to look and it looks good in so many shots because they, they chose the right angles. And, you know, even like, you know, the, when we first see the, the T-Rex, right? Like we're basically confined in the, in, in the Jeep the entire time. So, you know, mm-hmm. specifically did that. So we would experience seeing a T-Rex the same time that 
you know, are that the characters would see it, you know, and again, that's just those are little subtle, great filmmaking tricks because again, there's a thousand different ways to shoot something, but Spielberg well, not even just when you see the T-Rex, it's the buildup to it. I mean, that's right. an mm-hmm. iconic, water. iconic yeah. little glass of water, and you see the ripples the in it. Sound you know, of the footsteps in the background. Yeah. And what I understand that yeah. was that was a, a, a on the on the spot idea. That wasn't something that was planned out. For from what I understand, it was just something yeah. that they thought about doing really fast, and they did it, and it became iconic. Well, wow. apparently they uh, apparently. <laughs> Uh, yeah it's something similar to that pete they the they they knew they wanted that but they hadn't the 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 practical guy hadn't figured out how to do it yet they couldn't get the like the vibration right and then finally i think they got a guy underneath the the underneath the car he started strumming a guitar string and and those vibrations are what was able to get the nice little ripple thing you know again it's it's mac you know movie magic right there where you just got to figure something out like there's no sure. there's no there's no rules to some of this stuff and so you just got to literally get creative and you, that's why you need such a great team around you and you know I'll, I'll get to you know my favorite guy later but you know obviously this Spielberg couldn't have done this by himself and you know the whether it's the director of photography the you know the the visual effects guys the the practical effects guys uh, obviously John Williams I mean this is a completely different movie if John Williams doesn't score this you know and absolutely it's just a again a great great reason you brought up you brought up why this movie still holds up nowadays i think it's also because a big part of it is this this film follows storytelling beats yeah almost to a t like i'm a i'm a save the cat fan and and i i follow save the cat in terms of writing style um in terms of beats and the beats for each of those save the cat steps are are perfect they're almost right on maybe yeah. off by like a minute or so but it follows yeah the storytelling classic beat and it tells it properly and it does it all the special effects and, and all of the adventure and everything are, are what really kind of kind of tops everything off but the fact that they keep the beats and they keep that story moving forward and they do it in such a very clever way and the themes that they use throughout and um, a lot of the callbacks um, are really, really great to watch. Yeah. I watched it again and had just as much fun as I did the first time. Yeah. Agree. Absolutely. Thank you for uh, <laughs> uh, a little bit, of, a little bit of a, a budget and box office. So this film had a $63 million budget, which obviously in 93, that's a, that's a pretty big budget. That's a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. Ended up making 404 million domestically, which even today is a great haul. Uh, especially, right. especially on a sixty-three million dollar budget, and then it made uh, one point zero nine billion worldwide, just under one one billion. And obviously, this is the highest grossing film nineteen ninety three, and was the highest grossing film of all time until Titanic oh. came out four years later, five years later. Is it an Avatar the the yeah, highest that, grossing? Yeah, now it is. But oh. back then, it was Jurassic Park, then Titanic, Titanic for the longest time, then Avatar beat. Uh, oh wow. Titanic. Um, you had already mentioned this, Dominique, but uh, Robert e- Robert Ebert gave this three stars. Uh, he said this movie delivers all too well on its promise to show us dinosaurs. We see okay. them early and often, and they are indeed a triumph of special effects artistry. But the movie is lacking other qualities that it needs even more, such as a sense of awe and wonderment and strong human story values. So, like, I- what a dumb what a dumb comment! Like it needs more <laughs> awe. What was uh, you yeah? Know, I, that, that's the part where I'm like. It like when we first see the dinosaurs, watch this movie that wasn't an awestruck when they first saw those dinosaurs. Forget about when you first see it, um, when they when they climb out of that, whether they tell them to stop the jeeps. But when that T Rex comes out for that first time, when you get that full body yeah. shot, if you're not in awe at that moment, then there's no reason why you should even watch movies in the first place. Robert oh. Ebert, I mean, we've had this conversation before. The guy is just when it when it comes to great classic movies, he always comes up real short. Yeah, he just he has a different taste, I think. God rest his soul. He has, sure. he has a different different <laughs> opinion on things. I mean, look, he he he's obviously was one of the greatest of all time for a reason. But I, I I agree with Pete. I think there's certain films where I just don't think he can just sit back sit back and relax, you know. And you know, I, I don't I don't think this is a perfect film by any stretch of the imagination. But I also think 
that it does so many things right. Like I said, you just get caught up in the journey. And I think if you just let go and watch it, like it's a good, it's a good, nice thrill ride. So and what a dummy. Yeah. So this is going to lead us into our first little list here. Uh, so today we want to do the top five franchise franchises of all time. And yes. how we are going to be defining franchises are anything with four plus films. So again, anything bigger than a trilogy, because uh oh, what did you do? Uh oh, Rose. Well, what'd you do, Rose? No, I think it's three and more. Because if I put everything together, it's three and more. But not yet. Okay. I mean, look, we're, we're not going to be hard. We're not going to be hard on here. Uh, it's going to be your explanation, which is going to be determined. So we're going to have, we're adding something new to our format for our audience here. So Dominique, Pete and Rose are all going to be competing and oh. they're going to be competing in each category. I'll, ultimately I'm the judge and I will, I will determine whose list I like the most and, or, and, or your reasoning. So, uh, that that's the other thing. Whoever wins at the end of the thing gets to pick one of the next movies that we'll be reviewing. So give you a oh, little incentive nice. on to uh, sell me on why like it. are good. Um, okay. So, yeah. But I already have mine in mind for after my victory today. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> so we'll start with, uh, we'll start with Rose on this one since uh, she already said, uh-oh. Okay. We'll start with her. Okay. My top franchise by far, and I am very No, no, no. Sorry. start five. Start Rose, five. you always do this. Start with number five. Don't. Oh, oh my totally. god, I always say it. Okay, okay. Okay, okay, I'm gonna go like this. James Bond. Number five. Okay. okay. Number four. Hunger Games. Okay. But that's a three movie. That's why I said well, that. it's four. But no, it's, I four. Don't... it's four. Is that a part one and part two? Yeah. Part one and part two. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and it was on, I I'm saw okay. it, I saw it on several lists of when I was looking at franchises. So it, it works. Very oh, low okay. on very low on all those lists, but continue. <laughs> Actually on the critics list, it was super then, high. Star Wars. Number three. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then Lord uh, Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter are are uh like fighting the spot, but I will put Harry Potter first. Okay. So oh. Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter. Yeah, and Harry Potter would include Fantastic Beasts as well. Lord of the Rings would also include The Hobbit. So those are all considered those are the Hobbit and all of that. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Not a, bad, not a bad list, Rose. Okay. okay, we're gonna go with Pete Dog next. What do you got, Pete? Hey, this was a tough one for me because there were so many iconic like movies that have more than three. Right. But there's a couple of those movies that just took it off my list. Like, for example, Indiana Jones. That would have been up there if they hadn't have done crystal skull yeah um, yeah same and way. yep i had the same struggle i was like uh oh, you gotta I, go yeah <laughs> i did not put lord of the rings on there only because i was always angry that they made hobbit into three movies instead of like it's like a hundred page book but you yeah know, and, and, and it, wasn't, yeah, no. it wasn't as good yeah it wasn't as good um <clears throat> and so my number five i've got five movies listed here and I've been really struggling with this. Um, let it rip, Pete. Rip, rip off the band. Let it rip. Yeah, I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say Hannibal Lecter, the, wow. the franchise of Hannibal Lecter. Wow. Over I like over it. over Batman. Over oh, so that was my question. I, I was thinking about the Karate Kid, but does having a series? count as part of a franchise i would include it, yes. you can include it. I would, yeah that's a good question but i they also yeah, have the next karate kid too so they actually take yeah but that's why I, that's why i took it off the list because yeah. that was really cobra kai puts karate kid probably back on the list yeah i don't have it myself actually shoot that was my <laughs> that's another good one and so i also thought about rocky because the creed movies coming back but there were so many in between the end rocky ones that i just didn't like very much so i took that off the list all right so number five we'll keep it at hannibal lecter okay number four i put the mission impossible movies because each time i see a mission impossible it's there's not really a weak one. maybe the third one is maybe the weakest one but i, I still think overall still fun it's a strong franchise mm -hmm. there's no real weak points number three i put harry potter 
just because the first eight films <laughs> for me in the Harry Potter series are all wonderful. Uh, and well, I haven't and seen strong. the Harry Potter films, so I know it, that probably is going to be up there. I hear great things. I'm about to start watching what? all of them. I'm not about you to start watching them. Harry Potter at all? No. I oh, what, what is her bra doing? I know. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not, I wasn't a big fan of the Fantastic Beasts series so far. Hopefully the third one can make up for the first two. Uh, number two, I put Star Wars because you can't keep it off of the list at all. You got all the movies, even the ones in the middle that kind of struggle. But then now you just see this massive resurgence of all of these great uh, episodic um, shows coming on that, that are just near and dear to you know the characters are near and dear to us growing up and in our life yeah so you can't not have it on there and number one is this this is, is indisputable this is what makes my list the perfect list is the mcu franchise you can't you can't not have that as number one it's globally made like a hundred billion dollars and each movie is strong each one connects to each other. Each one is fun. It tells great stories. The acting is incredible for the most part. And that's my list. Perfect list. Beautiful job. Good mm. list. Uh, you know, if I had to critique your list, Hannibal number five, I think is a huge upset pick there for you. Um, that, that to me is your weak link on the list. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll see what Dominique's got. We'll see what Dominique's got. All right. So... Got a couple of the same, but I'm going to start you. out number five, and I'm going to preface by saying, while not maybe the Oscar-worthy films like some others, they are very entertaining, and I think that they've done very well, and it's been a lot of fun for me to watch, and that is the Fast and the Furious franchise. Um, yeah. You know, they continued on even after Paul Walker, God rest his soul, passed away. Yeah. And like I said, they're just a lot of fun, you know, right. and I mean, what else can you say about it? It's just, it's so ridiculous, right? I but wish they would follow just... a little bit of the uh, more practical effects versus all sure. CGI. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I agree they're still entertaining. And then, you, you know, you throw in Hobbs and Shaw. I, I like that film too, so. Right. So, franchise. I, I honestly have never seen a single fast movie Furious movie. Oh, watch the, five, the fifth one and you're done. Like it's the same, but yeah, they, uh, they've, the they've, they've, they've continued it on very long. Mm -hmm. um, coming in at number four is also Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible, again, I haven't been upset with any of them. Um, I chose Rocky as number three just because those first four were all good to me. Yeah. And, you know, they're just classic films that I grew up with. Yeah. I mean, I went to Philly and sit on the top of the stairs and did the thing, right? Yeah. Um, number two, two is Toy Story. And Had Toy that. Story nice. is near and dear to my heart. And my right? light year is about Before. to come out too, which will which would fall under. That's right. That's right. That is coming up. So yep, still still going strong. Um, you know, cut not as awe epic as Jurassic Park when is when it came out. And it was already like 15, I think, when Toy Story came out. But again, right. that feeling of seeing something like that so different for the first time was really, really cool. It and they just told the best stories. Oh, yeah. it changed the industry and and yeah it, it was on my it, I, I struggled not having that on my list yeah that's yeah, a that's a great one and then coming in at number one i'm just a huge star wars fan and i could not not choose star wars as my favorite again childhood favorites yeah um you know being an adult and just nerding out over mandalorian obi-wan right now john williams to me the most iconic soundtrack yeah um star wars just hits all the nails for me and so so both of you ladies did not have the mcu on your list are do you not like the mcu or just maybe so you, or it's just something i never really kind of got into it you know it came at a time i remember i think what was it spider-man was the first one that kind of came out is that uh, right am i wrong it would have been captain iron America. man maybe no, yeah iron man I iron man's the iron man yeah. yeah okay and so I remember watching those kind of first films and for me, just in my life and what was happening, I felt like those films came out just lightning fast and I almost just couldn't keep up. Got and it. by the time I wanted to kind of come back around and like catch up, it was like, was I don't even know where to start anymore. <laughs> you know, like there's yeah. just so much and so many and not to say, and I actually, I loved your explanation 
Pete, about it because you do hit the nail on the head. They tell wonderful stories and they're epic and they're so successful, wildly successful. And, you know, they've created this following and this whole community of people. And then, you know, now they have the new land at Disneyland and all the things or California yeah. Adventure. But it just, I don't know. It was just something that I personally never got into. Not to say that it should not be in the top five. Got it. I think, I think what, she what, just... I think she just gave me a victory right there with what she just said. Thank you so much. What Thank about you, you Rose? I, I, need to hear, I, I need to hear Rose. Yeah, you have to hear my list. The reason why I didn't put that one is because <laughs> it should have been there. Okay, it should have been, been there instead of Hunger Games. But my list is perfect because my list has different genres and the first one is Harry Potter, and I think Harry Potter changed the world in every aspect. And the first park and world that was ever like really made and changes everything is Harry Potter. And we still have plays, we still have the books. We everybody loves Harry Potter. So I think giving Harry Potter the first one, and I don't know if mm -hmm. Harry Potter made more money. I, I should I should have said that. No, but, not to make more. But MCU is the number one. Oh come on! Star Wars maybe Star Wars maybe can compete with because it's got series and stuff. But and Star Wars, the first three. That's why it's in my list because the first three saved it because I think the middle three with Anakin they're the worst. The chemistry between Padme and Anakin and yeah. the actor who makes Anakin, I think they didn't Agreed. chose. Uh, a very good actor like yeah, I, 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 that will kill them but the first three they're just epic all right so okay. my list is definitely win. probably a hybrid of, of of everybody's so uh honorable mentions the ones that that, that uh, didn't quite make the list but i love them as franchises one is the the jack ryan franchise uh oh, yeah. I, I love i love those films just, the new series jack ryan which i love um it was actually on my list and then i forgot about batman but um Love the Jack Ryan series and, you know, excellent. Uh, I actually like the X-Men franchise as well. There's a lot of uh, spinoffs and, you know, Deadpool would be included on in that franchise. So um, it's really? not part of the MCU. Yeah, N not part of the MCU. <laughs> not yet. Uh, Indiana Jones, we already discussed it. Number four pretty much knocks it from being on this list. And then the other one I like is uh, Die Hard uh, huh. franchise. You know, That's some cool. of the other ones, some of the later ones were, you know, just okay, but I, I just love Die Hard in general, so yeah, you know, it's just always an honorable mention. No, that's that one. You you, you love the first three, and you sure. should. But then like the rest four. of them. I like it's, four and five. Just again, I, I like them. Didn't love them. Uh, yeah. Number number five for me is Mission Impossible for all the reasons we just mentioned. It's just uh, there, there's not a weak spot really in those films, and for consistency wise, it, it's great. Uh, number four for me is is Batman. Uh, I think the new Batman pretty much, I, I don't think I would have included it until this new Batman, because now you basically have three iterations of mm -hmm. uh, great films, which is the, the original Tim Burton, you know, the Christopher Nolan series is, you know, one of the greatest trilogies of all time. And then uh, this new version I really enjoyed. So number would three, you, would you would you include uh, the Joker in that in that franchise? You could you could if you wanted to. I mean, I think that's a uh, 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 what's the word arbitrary. No. no, that's an argument that you can make. Yeah, that's subjective. Subjective, yeah. I think it's subjective, but uh, yeah, I mean, theoretically, I guess you could. You could theoretically include Suicide Squad, I guess. Mm -hmm. Don't. Ooh. Don't. Don't, don't, don't include it. Otherwise, it's <laughs> yeah, don't. Yeah, otherwise, exactly. Uh, number three is 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 Rocky. Uh, I I liked all six films. Number five was probably the weakest, but then. I really love Creed and even Creed 2 with bringing back Drago's son. So I think, again, and you're also talking to like how many times I've watched it, like Rocky, I can exactly. watch any right. time. And, <laughs> you know, and the original was an Oscar winning film. So it's not just, you know, popcorn. It's also some really good mm -hmm. writing, including Creed, uh, which was really well written. Uh, number two, and you know, and I, I would say I probably like number two better than I like number one, but number two is Star Wars. Um, but I would agree with Pete. Number one is MCU. Okay. Just literally, mm -hmm. just literally based off the numbers, it's the most successful uh, per movie franchise of all time. And there's really the weakest link is better than the Star Wars weakest link. And you know, for me again, that separates it. But 
my favorite would Willow. be Star Wars. If I just picked a favorite, it's Star Wars franchise. But MCU, I would say, wins um, wins the uh, overall franchise based off the numbers. So with that, I will grant Peter the victory only because oh. you guys omitted the MCU altogether, which I just, again, I don't, <laughs> I don't think there's an argument to be made that it's not a top five Insane. franchise. Especially yeah, since you included Hunger Games, you included the Fast and Furious. MCU will smash the Fast and Furious <laughs> any of the movie. So, Pete, you win round one. I'll mark Thank that you. on my little. Let me just mark. Let me mark a one here for me. One, <laughs> one zero. Good job, Pete. Oh, look, Holly, mark there. Okay, and so the next right. category is the Oscar goes to, and this goes to uh, a cast or crew member who performed the best. This could be the writer, director, cinematographer, whoever you think just put such an imprint on this film um, that deserves the recognition. So the actual people that won Oscars, uh, it won for Best Sound, Gary Summers, Gary Rydstrom, Sean Murphy, Rod Judkins. Obviously the sound is amazing here. Uh, also won Sound Effects Editing, which was Gary Rydstrom and Richard Hims. And then Best Effects, Visual Effects, Dennis Murin, Stane Winston, Phil Tippett, Michael Lantieri. And so we'll start with Dominique on this one. Dominique, who do you think won the Oscar for this one? Man, that's a tough question because there's so much happening. It is. But we, we have the, the hard-hitting questions here. You do. Podcast. You really do. You make you make this brain think. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. You know, if I have to go like just lightning answer, just because you said it, and then like as you were saying it, my brain was like, yes, sound you know, yeah. just with, I, I, yeah, all of the, the sound. And I have this thing with sound, right? And like soundtracks. And I always wanted to do sound for film. Right. And, you know, you mentioned it earlier with like the movie magic. And when you watch those kind of behind the scenes and how they create some of these sounds, it's pretty epic, right? Like yeah, just yeah. the thought process that goes into it. And so that's going to be my choice. I'm going to say sound on that one. Yeah, for, for sure. sure. Gary, well, Gary sir. Rydstrom is pretty much the guy. He won two Oscars compared to the other guys, but. Yeah, let's, let's go Gary. That's, yeah. a, that's a good choice. Good choice. Peter, yeah. who yeah. gets your Oscar? I, 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 my Oscar goes to, to the guy that already got the Oscar for it. The, the visual effects were something that we'd never seen before. And Stan Winston. Yeah. I mean, they were, they were groundbreaking at the time and it was, it was a pleasant experience when you first get yeah. in there and you watch this film. So yeah, if, yeah, if not, then I would give it to, I wouldn't even give it to Spielberg because I'm sure there were other movies that year that were, you know, better in terms of directing, but, or John Williams maybe, but I think I got to go visual effects. Yeah, it's a good call. Stan Winston was excellent. Again, when you, when you read all the different things, I mean, you guys are both right. I mean, again, they obviously won, they both won Oscars. So uh, sure. You know, no, no surprises there, but I, yeah, Stan Winston, what he, I think he had a harder job just because, you know, you're, you're literally dealing with like physical limitations. I mean, they built a real dinosaur and you're dealing with, you know, animatronics and, and the weight that they had to do that. The thing actually like ran, uh, I mean, it's insane when you read some of these stories, but uh, yeah, it's, it's intense. Rose, Rose, what do you got for best Oscar? just because i cannot go with the same because we, we we're trying to compete here yeah. i would have gone with sound also i think they made an amazing job there because they don't even they, they have the music but everything is sound effects and they somehow managed to take you there so you're there with yeah. only the sound so i think that they did an amazing job but i'm gonna leave sound uh, to that mix so i'm gonna choose cinematography i think cinematography this movie is amazing and it has so much similarities with uh, Stranger Things right now that I'm watching. Yeah. Mm. And that nostalgia and the experience of going there, it, it brings you, like it takes you to another world. Mm -hmm. And when they, and, and that's why I love also Harry Potter because the way yeah. they take you to another world. So I won't give it to cinematography and all the, all, all the shots and all the filmmaker, when you, when you see that movie and then you analyze the shots and, and the movement and everything, I know yeah. that's a mix with the director and the and the cinematographer, but yeah. I'm gonna give it more to the cinematographer. Yeah, uh, obviously, yeah. Well, great, great choice. Can I well. jump in and say one more thing about sound, really quick? Because I just yeah, said well, this. Go for it. Did we know what a dinosaur sounded like? Right. 
We, yeah. And they created all these different sounds. For right, 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 right. Amen. I would have gone I with mean, sound. Also. You know, who imagined that and then created it? That's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, Amen. No, I would have gone with sound. <laughs> too bad we're not voting on this one. Just the lists there, my darling. Well, <laughs> no, no, no. These, 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 ones, these, yeah, these ones count, Pete. These ones count. Oh, these ones count? Oh, yeah. Everything. Yeah. Counts. Yeah, I, know, well, I lost for sure. Oh yeah, I lost um, also. I'm well, losing everything. Well, Pete, I will say this: I had Stan Winston as well. Um, Thanks. but but I'm going to say out of explanation, Dominique had the best explanation. So I'll well, give you on this one. Uh, if who, I knew, if I knew, I had to just say. Well, can I just say one more thing about the yeah, visual effects? That's just, that was a sneaky move she just did there. That was a sneaky move she just did. That was a she, she stole it from me. She just literally stole it from me. She stole the point. That was a that was a, that was a dirty play. But I was yeah. I was being uh, polite, so I was like, okay, I'm not going to steal the point. Yeah. And well, really and, and going back to it, like I said, I, John Williams obviously deserves a, a, a high, high honorable mention. This is one of my favorite scores of all time. And yeah. it, it's just such a visceral soundtrack, too, because uh, it, it legitimately adds emotion to the scene. Like, again, where Roger Ebert, I think, just missed the boat when we see the dinosaurs the music that's playing at the same time with that is is it, it gives you chills every single time and yep it's excellent and then i i can't even i, I don't want to underscore what steven spielberg did and there's just so there's so many different instances where you you, you spielberg you you see his imprint compared to someone else directing and we're going to talk about that in a second but i, I mean there, there's one part where you know uh goldblum's talking about you know you know, God creates man, you know, mm -hmm. or God creates dinosaurs, God destroys dinosaurs, God creates man, man kill, uh, destroys God, man creates dinosaurs. And then she goes, you know, women, uh, uh, God or man kills, or God kills man. Dinos dinosaurs kill man. And oh yeah, women, dinosaurs kill man. Women inherits the earth. Women inherit the earth. <laughs> but the way the camera move, it, it goes from her and then it rack focuses to Sam Neill and Jeff Goldblum. But then the camera then pans out and then we, we see like the next dinosaur and all that. And again, that's a, such a Spielberg type of move um, because not too many guys just, again, have the mastery of, of when to move the camera, when not to, where to put the focus. It's just, again, just little little things like that. Just, uh, really well, and just based on that one scene, you know, something that also Spielberg does very well is, is take a take a female character and really empower her and, and mm -hmm. really make her a very strong, independent, tough, sassy, but not like stupid sassy, but like mm -hmm. intelligent sass. And just like, I'm not going to take any shit from anybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I think Laura Dern really did a really incredible job with this role. Um, yeah. There, there's some interesting casting stuff when he talks about it. I just literally read, um, when he chose her, he actually didn't think she was right for the role initially. And then, um, because he was thinking initially it was going to be need to be more like a Sigourney Weaver, Linda Hamilton type. So a little more mm -hmm. like naturally tougher type woman, but then yeah, it's, it's too tough. Right. And then that's ultimately what he came to the conclusion because th her role is actually more intelligence and, mm -hmm. and then it's also, very motherly too. Like yeah. She's, she's very motherly trying to, to hammer that point home to Dr. Grant. Like, yeah, but I want to be a mother, dude. Yeah. I also read something recently that kind of blew my mind. She was 23 when she made that film. Hmm. Lord Dern was 20, right? Is your mind blown right now? Really, yeah. right? Well, yeah, 23. Wow. I was like, what? She's younger than I am. Wow. Uh, only I 20. Know that. I didn't yeah, know that, that that really was like mind blowing to me. Wow, that's incredible. All that's right, a good so fact. You you win you win a point for the good fact. Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> right. The next category is the Get Me Ari Gold Award for different castings. So, uh, so originally, we'll start with even just again the director. So initially, when Michael Crichton wrote the book, uh, he circulated to six studios and directors. Warner Brothers wanted it for Tim Burton to direct. Columbia Pictures wanted it for Richard Donner. Twentieth Century Fox uh, wanted it for Joe Dante, who did um, Dante's Peak, I believe, right, or um, Volcano, one of those. Uh, Universal Pictures wanted for Steven Spielberg, and then there's also uh, uh, James Cameron had wanted to do the movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger as Grant, Bill Paxton as Malcolm, and Charlton Heston as Hammond. So my question for you guys with just this first part, 
is besides take Spielberg off the table. We already know he was the best choice. He was Crichton's number one choice. But if you had to choose another director out of those, what which one would you have preferred to have seen? James Cameron. James Cameron. Yeah. Pete, who, who, what about you? Uh, nobody on that list at all. Yeah, I, neither. If I was going to, I mean, I, I would go Richard Donner. Richard Donner would be the only one I because he did Goonies, and mm -hmm. you know I think he can kind of combine a little bit of that awe and a little bit of that. The James Cameron, I would say no, only because James Cameron version too was long to make a movie. Well, <laughs> movie well, that, wouldn't have that, but I heard I heard his days. version was going to be like super dark and gory. Like it would. Oh been, well, like, then no. It would have been like <laughs> lots of dinosaurs eating people. Like it had just been. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> too, much of a, too much of an like an action fit versus like if 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 I had to pick another director to do this particular movie I, I would only choose somebody like a like a robert zemeckis uh, other than huh. him yeah. i wouldn't that's the one that i was going to say robert zemeckis because i think we, he did an amazing job with back to the future Pete, come come in with the steel <laughs> nice. I'll, I'll give you a point for that pete thank you oh, yeah Robert, God, I are we tied yeah. first no pete just took I the win but i had to it's two to one. Okay, some other I casting. Uh, Sean Connery was offered the role of John Hammond uh, based off of Indian, uh, Henry Jones Jr., but he turned it down. Um, Sandra Bullock, Gwyneth Paltrow, Julianne Moore, Helen Hunt, Terry Hatcher, Elizabeth Hurley, Sherilyn Finn all tested for the role of Ellie Sattler. Uh, Robin Wright was awful, also offered the role. Nicole Kidman, Heather Graham, Lisa Rena, Renee Zellweger, Kim Raver, and Mariska Hargay were also among, among those considered. Yeah, so basically uh, everyone in the world. Yeah, and there's right. like another list too. Jody Foster, Tony <laughs> Weaver, Michelle Pfeiffer, Ali Sheedy, Judy Davis, Daryl Hunter, amongst <laughs> others. Uh, Honestly, yeah. yeah amongst who, everyone who, else. Besides Laura Dern, and I think, you know, Pete, you already mentioned you already loved Laura Dern, but if you had to choose somebody else out of all those, who, who else would you have chosen to replace? Well, I mean, it's not that I loved Laura Dern per se. I mean, she was who was casted and she's the one that I saw do it and I thought she did I thought she played this really strong, empowered woman. Yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. Brilliantly. Um, she wouldn't have been my choice, but I'm, that's why I don't cast people in the movies. <laughs> uh, based on this incredibly massive list that you gave us. Yeah, seriously. Um, I think just because of the time period, um, maybe maybe Helen Hunt, just because she went on to do like Twister. Um, That's what even Robin, Robin Wright would have been really good. I mean, she was really good in The Princess Bride and, and then she's also gone on to do a, a bunch of other kinds of movies. I mean, those are both really strong women. Um, yeah. yeah, maybe Helen Hunt, I don't know. How about you, Rose? Uh, Sandra Bullock or, yeah, no, I will go Sandra Bullock. I will go Sandra Bullock because I don't know, it, it would have given a, a thing. And also, I didn't say the director, but I was going to go Robert Simic, but also Sean Levi. I, I don't know if he would have been in I don't know if good been age for that. Yeah, I don't, I think it's too young. The Duffer uh, Brothers. Yeah. yeah he's too young, great. but I think he would have done an amazing job for that one. Yeah, you, but I think you, he would have done an amazing job. What about you, Dominique? I like the Helen Hunt choice. I, I do because of Twister and kind of being in that same, you know, kind of genre. But I don't know. Guy. My first thought was uh, Jamie Lee Curtis for some reason. I don't know. Just kind of during that time, I was thinking about what she was doing. Like she was so great in True Lies that yeah. came out a couple years after that, maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, I, you know, obviously she's known for the Halloween franchise, which is another large franchise that we all right. know mentioned. Yeah. Um, but I think she's, you know, she's a bit of a badass in her own right and also very smart and could have played that role, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, those would, win. those would have been interesting. Um, I'm going to go, I hate to do this, guys. I'm going to go with Pete only because Helen Hunt was, oh, come on. <laughs> Helen Hunt was who I thought. Yeah, that, that, that was my initial impression was Helen Hunt. It's, it's too I easy. But it's okay. clearly there's, still, there's a lot of game left, guys. There's a lot of game left. Don't get sometimes don't get you guys. just sometimes you just understand a film, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and Helen Hunt was literally the only other one I, I, I was thinking too, but I don't know if she was maybe not ready yet, but it would have been Elizabeth Hurley because I really like her in Austin Powers. 
Not but, in that no. role. No. <laughs> Come can't. on. That might just be my, my own personal uh, no way. here, but yeah. Uh, Helen Hunt was, old. Helen was my somebody, choice. You can't have somebody that gorgeous in this role. It would have taken away from it. I don't disagree with that. I was being super selfish there. And I don't mean that, I don't mean that in like Laura Dern is not a beautiful woman or that Helen Hunt. No, is I, I, I know. Not we what know, I mean. We but a supermodel in in a in a movie like this is would be ridiculous. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. It would be more of a I get a minus I get a minus yeah. point for that as a suggestion. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <there, Paul>. um, <laughs> uh, other oh, one God, gonna... dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> Anna Klumsky and Christina Ritchie were both auditioned for the role of Lex Murphy that and that went to Ariana, not Grande, but uh, Ariana. Oh, I can't remember her name Ariana either. Ariana Grande was so good in this movie. <laughs> uh, Jim Carrey was also considered for the role of uh, Ian Malcolm. Also Michael Keaton, Bruce Campbell, Johnny Depp, Ted Danson, Steve Gutenberg, and Michael J. Fox. Pete, how would Michael J. Fox sound in this? <laughs> Are you telling me? <laughs> There are dinosaurs yeah. in a park. <laughs> nice, Pete. Nice. It's like uh, the worst yeah, impression ever. Doc, you're telling me there's dinosaurs? <laughs> so, guys, out of those ones, Jim Carrey, Michael Keaton, Campbell, Depp, Danson, Gutenberg, Michael J. Fox, who would you have selected? Obviously, without you know removing Jeff Goldblum. So, who would you select? Pete, you're raising your hand. Why are you raising your hand? I'm going Michael Keaton. He wants to go first and win because I was going to say Michael Keaton, but I'm, I'm, I'm going Michael Keaton because he, on, he has a level of seriousness, but yeah. he also has a very comedic value yeah, to great. him. He can do both very well. I mean, he started as a stand-up comic. This guy's a funny, funny dude, and yeah. he's a brilliant actor. Michael Keaton, hands down. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Agreed. Okay. Well, okay. I, I would actually agree with that. Someone- no, 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 you don't have to choose something. You, no one will get points for this one because we're all pretty much agreed on that one. So everybody gets yeah. a point. Yeah, everyone gets a point. Um, yeah. The only other one I would say would have been Ted Danson. Ted Danson, I think, may have been able to do it too because he's got kind of that nonchalant, kind of smart. But I agree. Michael Keaton, I think, would have. He doesn't have the look, you know? Sure. Jeff Tell Gold- me that back to the woods on the, a good job. Jeff Goldblum had this this look to him, and I think oh. Keaton would have would have had a look as oh Paul, <laughs> good. Stop it. so good. Address the part. <laughs> All right, what else do we have? Uh, oh, okay, so we'll go, we'll move to Grant. Steven Spielberg considered Richard Dreyfus. Uh, Kurt Russell turned down the role because of Alan Grant due to salary demand. So one of the things Spielberg said with a lot of this. So obviously, this is a pretty, you know. N- not no name cast, but they're, these guys are not necessarily like super A listers. But part of the reason was was budget. You know, he had just done Hook with Robin Williams, Julie Roberts, and uh, Dustin Hoffman, and spent a lot of his budget just on those actors. And so this one, he really wanted to spend the money on the dinosaurs. So this is why he went with obviously very good actors, but not a mm. Kurt Russell who 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 was asking a lot of money um this is a tough one harrison ford would have been the same way just cost too much money but let's just say money's not an issue uh because we know this is going to make a billion dollars uh you choose between richard dreyfus kurt russell william hurt or harrison ford harrison ford oh i'm sorry there's a couple others uh <sighs> dennis quaid kevin costner mel gibson robin williams oh mel gibson or harrison ford Uh, I'm stuck between Dennis Quaid and William Hurt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those the um because Dennis Quaid is prime uh, Dennis Quaid. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah I'm, I, like in my mind, I'm going back to that kind of time. Yeah. And you know how they were doing then. And so I'm kind of leaning more Dennis Quaid than William Hurt, I think. Yeah, and if I think if the role was different, I think Kevin Costner may have been able to do it, but I don't think like Kevin Costner's too much of him. And yeah. I, don't I don't think know. that yeah. would fit what this role needed. But I agree Dennis Quaid still has a kind of that charisma. Yeah, exactly. That's a that's a good one. What about you, Rose? I said Harrison Ford or Mel Gibson. And yeah. I'm being I, I, mean, I think, I think Harrison Ford would have been great, but I think the problem with Ford, yeah it's too much similar indiana jones and yeah. so 
that may so, struggle. Yeah. But I think best, like if we had to choose probably just purely the best person, if you if there was no Indiana Jones, I think Harrison Ford obviously would oh, yeah. easily Definitely. be that choice. But I think Indiana Jones, unfortunately, steps on this movie's toe, especially when you're dealing with Spielberg. You're getting, sure. you know, you're going to get that little thing. Pete, what do you got? Well, that would have been pre-anti-Semitic Mel Gibson in that role. Would have been. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Lethal Weapon. Weapon. You're, you're basically dealing with Lethal Weapon Mel Gibson. Right. So he I, really I hasn't know, known I, much. I kind of I, I kind of love that they didn't cast an, an, a really great A-list actor for this role. I don't think that this role required it. And I like the way um, the role was played down a little yeah. bit. Um, but I, in a weird way, and you guys are going to make me lose the list. I get it, but I'm going to say it anyways. I, I'm really curious how Robin Williams would have done in this role. I mean, his his sort of serious movies, he's brilliant. He um, is. And so, but I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen him in sort of an action kind of movie. But I don't know. He's the name that stood out. I know what he would have said to Hammond. And that's, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. And, and then he would have hugged. <laughs> he would have said that to the T-Rex. <laughs> Can you imagine? They're hugged. just hugging it at the end. And they, look, this, this park disaster, it's, it's not your fault, man. It's not your fault. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to give, I'm going to give Dominique the point here. Cause I actually, Thank I, you. I also agree with the William Hurt. And that actually goes to your point, Pete, which is why you should have probably selected William Hurt because William Hurt is, is probably the best out of all those, the, the, like the least kind of star power, but probably the best actor that could have really done yes. that role. So he, he couldn't have done Dead Poets. Well, we're not casting for Dead Poets right now, Pete. We're doing Jurassic Park. So. <laughs> That's you, how great you Robin can Williams. Can that lip, you can put that lip, I'm gonna take away a point from you. <laughs> uh, what else? Uh, one other, I think there's one other casting. Oh, for Hammond, um, there was Clint Eastwood. Uh, we, were, we were talking about Sean Connery, Clint Eastwood, Marlon Brando for Hammond. What do you guys think about any of those? No. Clint uh, Eastwood, because if you put Marlon Brando there, come on, I think it would have been a... He's like yeah. super old at this point. He's like super uh, old. Clint Eastwood, I, don't, I think, is not cheery enough i mean that's just an angry hammond yeah he's just yeah, yeah. so is martin brandon i don't think <laughs> yeah i don't think yeah i don't i don't, I can't I don't, either I don't one i don't think either of those were good i think they're just no. Yeah. no we won't we won't vote on that one i don't that one's just a terrible uh just some other casting notes here we're, none of these can be voted on but danny glover was considered for the role of ray which ray is who ray that's Samuel Jackson's part, right? I turned him back in. I thought he had a different name. I can't remember. No, his is Arnold. Who's Ray? Who's Ray? I don't even see Ray in here. He's that blind piano player. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I have no idea who Ray is. Um, James, James <laughs> okay. was considered for the role of Gennaro. Gennaro, I believe, was the, the guy with the gun, right? Yeah, the, like, gamekeeper. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, no, no, that's, I, that's Muldoon. Oh, Gennaro is the guy, he's the lawyer. So oh, he yeah, I can see that. That oh, yeah, yeah, I get that. James Woods can really play like an asshole really well. Yeah. Like he's such a sleaze ball in casino. Yeah. You yeah. know, Ooh, that's he might just, have even he might have even elevated that role a little bit. So you know what? Yeah, exactly. I'm thinking about it. Like he that total sleaze ball could totally play that. Imagine in the Jeep just going, ooh, piece of candy. Ooh, <laughs> or even or even who's the what's the guy's name? He was in Jerry Maguire. He was the other agent. Oh, oh, Jay Moore. Oh, uh, Jay yeah, Moore. Jay. He would have been good in that. I think he'd been yeah. too young though. He probably would have been too, oh, no, too young. Uh, yeah, he's kind of young though for that role. Uh, who else? Uh, Jake Gyllenhaal was considered for the role of Tim, which is the the boy. Yeah. Uh, Brian Cox was for Muldoon. Jeffrey Rush for Muldoon. I mean, that, that would have been a solid one. I really like Bob Peck though. Uh, he was great. Yeah, I liked him too. He had the accent, nailed it. Carly Sheen for Nedry, which Nedry is no. that's new. Oh, Wayne Knight. Uh, Newman's, yeah, no, Wayne Knight, no. No, Wayne Knight. Carly Sheen is no. Newman? No. No. Yeah, no. Negative. All right. So with this, because of the, the bit rolls, uh, we're gonna go into the top five Samuel L. Jackson roles 
This was a yeah. awesome exercise. This is one of the tougher ones I've ever had to do. Agree. And so many, yeah. because he also like, what I, what I like about Samuel Jackson's career is obviously he's been a star. He's been a, a supporting actor, but he can come in for five minutes and just knock it out of the park and then go home. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. and so he's got a lot of great roles. So I'm, I'm going to be definitely curious to see who's got what. Um, we will start with Rose. We'll start with you. Okay, I'm gonna go with five this time. So for me, number five, and you're gonna laugh about this, but I think he's so great that even his voice makes so much noise, but in The Incredibles as uh, persona, mm -hmm. I think he's amazing. Yeah. And you can you can see some of the action in, in the character. So for sure. I went with Definitely that one. has a very distinct voice. Um, yeah. Then uh hateful eight or seven, eight, yeah, yeah. No, hateful eight. Yeah. Hateful yeah. Eight. Excellent that. Excellent that one, yeah. Uh and the second one, the other one is the young on chain. So yeah. I have two. Um what's his director name? Quentin Tarantino. Quentin Tarantino's movies. Yeah. Then this was the difficult. And I know this is probably gonna be the first for all of you, but I put second pulp fiction. Mm -hmm. Because for me, a time to kill is his best movie. Oh, like I the about. time. Yeah. Yeah. He that's gave good. he gives his monologue. And I no, like, that's everybody cries. In that one. Good call, Rose. Yes, oh, he deserved to die. <laughs> yeah, no. You, you I hope you burn in hell. <laughs> and, and then he comes and and snaps against the, the the two guys and everything. I think for me, the first one is a, a time to kill. Like I know Paul Fiction is good, but in that one, that one scene is one scene that I will watch and watch and watch Absolutely. and watch and no, cry. it's definitely an iconic scene. Every time. That's a good list. Forgive Rose. me, Rose. Forgive me. What was your number five? I didn't hear. My number four Incredible. was The Incredibles. I think Incredible. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Good. All right, Pete. Let's see That's what you got. Nice. Uh, okay. So my top five Samuel Jackson roles. Number five, of course, Pause of Fury, The Legend of Hank, which comes out <laughs> July 15th. Good plug. Pete. Near I you. like wow. it. I like it. Perfect. <laughs> Produced by somebody who is super awesome. Directed by Rob Minkoff, who, of course, directed the original Lion King. Uh, he is incredible in that. And the guy that produced him was even more incredible. Uh, number four, I picked Unbreakable. Was promotion. Yeah, sorry, had to do it. Yeah, yeah. Number to. four, I put Unbreakable um, because I love that character a lot. And yeah. he was obviously in three movies after that. It was, it was just really cool to see him in in that kind of a role and not a ridiculous superhero role like a Nick Fury, but like, sure. like a human version of a, a superhero. Yeah. Number three, I put, I put time to kill because I agree. It was, it was a phenomenal movie. Yeah. Not only the, he deserves the burn in hell, but even all of the very emotional um, moments between, you know, him and his family and, and between him and Matthew McConaughey and trying to make him realize why, he's seeing things differently um yeah. just really powerful 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 movie uh number two i put uh die hard with a vengeance because it was uh it was in a hilarious role it was almost like the the same sam jackson that you know and love but in a different setting where he's just running around with bruce willis all day and it's funny and i laughed the whole time he opened his mouth and number one i mean you could go with any of his Quentin Tarantino roles, but you can't you can't not put Pulp Fiction as his most iconic, best performed, more quoted than any other role that he's ever had in his life. So Pulp Fiction is number one for sure. Good call. Dominique, what do you got? So I'm very similar to the uh, lists that have already been given. Uh, number five came in with Steven and Django just because I thought he was just so great and entertaining in that. Uh, number four, I liked, and let me just preface by saying these are all movies that I know and love and have seen. I know sure. there's a ton of other roles that he's done that I'm not familiar yeah. with. But number four, um, you know, his bit part in Coming to America, right? I, I love mean, that movie. Nice. It's 
it's just it's, <laughs> so it's like you funny. said earlier Poe. you know when you said that he can just come in and yeah. do a little five second scene and be on his way and just like you know make his mark i i really feel like he did in that yeah. um number three uh gotta go star wars mace windu jedi yeah right good one um also because he added diversity. That was the first time I feel like diversity was added to a Star Wars movie. Um, now we see it a lot. I think afterwards you didn't really see it until like Rogue One maybe, but prior to that, it was not very diverse cast. So I was glad to see him added to that. Right. I think um, Lando would have an argument to make with you though. <laughs> that's true. That's right. Like good old Lando Calrissian. How could I forget? Um, five, Malt <laughs> yeah. Um, and I struggled between my one and two, piggybacking off the other lists. Uh, I gotta go, this is hard for me to say it, but A Time to Kill, Carly Haley is number two. Yeah. And I think because uh, it was the first book that I read where I felt like the film followed so closely to how the character development was written in the book. Yeah. Um, and he just really hit the nail on the head as far as this man that obviously committed a heinous crime but you know you you you're rooting for him you 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 feel his pain you feel his anger you feel his motive yeah, um you know all of those things um and then yeah number one i'm agreeing with you on you know pulp fiction jewels are you kidding me i remember being 14 super inappropriate what was i doing at the theater watching pulp fiction right <laughs> and uh you know it I mean, how many years later has that been? 25, maybe. And I'm still quoting it to this day. Yeah. You know, the one that says bad motherfucker, right? Yeah, like, yeah. it just never gets old. Um, I've watched an interview with him recently when people asked him about, uh, you know, the host, whoever the interviewer was, was asking him about Pulp Fiction or just his favorite roles that he had done himself. And he said, you know, to this day, all these years later, he gets people asking him, you know, uh, about the royale with cheese it's just yeah it goes down and i think too for me that was the first film that i had seen by tarantino that i was like whoa what is this this is so different and it was also the first film that i saw where it had all those different stories going on with all these different characters right. and how they all connected later on and that i'd never seen anything like that before and that was pretty epic too for sure for sure good list uh so i have i have number five jurassic park only because you know hold on to your butts is, your butts. right in the way he's yeah. just always has a cigarette in his mouth while he talks yep. that is one of the hardest things in the world to do um uh, again just kind of a bit part obviously it's not a hit <laughs> for him but you know he, he's one of the more likable characters in this film uh i number four originally had mace windu but then i switched it out for the other guys and he went uh he's pk highsmith and it's just again another small role for him but he just comes in you know him and the rock come in and again like when you're talking about you need a you know a badass motherfucker to be this role yeah you know, that's that's what samuel jackson does and he just comes in and crushes it and then you know when him and the rock just give each other dap before they <laughs> jump off the, the the building it's just again iconic uh number three die hard with a vengeance zeus uh like pete mentioned it's just such an excellent role and sure it's just so entertaining Again, he, he just knows how to he, he knows how to master making it tolerable to watch angry. You know what I mean? And he, he just does it so well. Number two for me, Unbreakable, uh, Elijah. And then number one, Pulp Fiction, Jules. Now, I totally forgot about Time to Kill. I must have just kind of glanced it over. But I agree with all you guys. That should have been on my That's list. That's a great movie. That should have oh, been okay. on my list. And I, I, I messed up there. Uh, I don't, without completely wrecking my list, I'd probably replace it with the other guy's role but i well, still yeah i got to you, you definitely lost this one dude yeah yeah well you're i'm not in competition <laughs> I guess I know, but if you were done uh, yeah i would have <laughs> lost just because i omitted time to kill all right well i, I actually like all your guys' lists you have, you guys all have strong lists uh I'm, for our audience out there if you really want a, a really fun listen with sam jackson uh go to youtube and type in uh he he read a children's audio book called oh, Go, Go the Fuck, to Go the yeah. fuck to oh, Sleep. Yeah. It's yeah. hilarious. It is so good. If you're a parent, you can totally, totally relate. relate. And so I've, I have a special treat for us. Start the tour. Hold on to your butt. He 
just gonna eat the goat. What's the matter, kid? Never had lamb chops? Excellent. Yeah, obviously the main point of that was so you can see my incredible acting skills because I had two iconic lines in that show and that's hold on to your butts and what's the matter, kid? You don't like lamb chops? It's an awesome job. So anyways, so moving forward. <laughs> uh moving forward oh well, where was i at we were uh i need it's to not your fault yeah it's not your fault uh so the next category is it's not your fault most powerful scene that gets you emotional by the way the last samuel jackson honestly I, I you guys all did a really good job so we'll call that a wash because i don't i think you all had good points so we'll call that equal um it's not your fault most powerful scene that gets you emotional um so this can be like I said, any, any sort of emotion. So it's not necessarily like crying or, you know, just any sort of scene that just gets you an emotional. So uh, we'll start with you, Dominique. What was your most powerful scene? Powerful scene. So I know the most heartwarming scene, but that's not powerful. Let me think, let me think, gosh. More, me more emotion, what, what, what scene gives you the most emotion, I guess, that, that's the other way to define it. Um, it, could be, it could be terror, it could be. Okay, so yeah, let's go terror because I feel like this, I think, you know what, believe it or not, uh, the part that kind of creeped me, scared me, I, creeped me out the most was when Nedry, which is Wayne Knight's character gets, taken down by the dinosaur in the jeep oh yeah he sprays him in the eyes and he like like because it's just so like you already know where this is kind of going a little bit you know what i mean yeah. and then to see it happen is just like it's just super gruesome and it just it just gets me more sure. so than i think the other dinosaur attacks in the movie sure that right. one got the most sure one of the best examples of somebody who really deserved to get it finally yeah it. Oh, i loved it when he got killed yeah, it was good. But it was like, it was just like, the like, because I think you feel that confinement of being in the car and like you're trapped, you know? Yeah. So that's what creeped me out the most. For sure. Pete, what do you got? Um, for me, it's when the T-Rex first appears full body and walks in between the two cars. It's, it was, it was magical. It was something you'd never seen before in a film, in a feature film. And it, I, I was blown away by it and inspired yeah, for sure. Rose, what about you? I'm going to go deep. Uh, I think the part where Hammond realizes that he failed. So that's uh -oh. kind of uh, close with the human heart. <laughs> yeah, with the human heart. And sometimes when the human heart starts to control things, that's the realization. We don't have control of things. So yeah. that Amen. moment is for me yeah. epic. It's like... And is that is that when, really, when him and Laura Dern are eating? Is that is that the scene you're talking about? Yeah, when he when he looks at the at the at the thing and he knows like realizing that yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, um, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's got the it's got the piano too, right? It's got the ding ding ding. ding. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent scene. Dominique, you're gonna say something. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to piggyback off that because I I I think you hit the nail on the head, Rose, and my vote is for you. And I luckily the I'm the voter. Comes, and uh <laughs> <laughs> but the other scene that comes to mind that's similar to that is at the very very end of the film when they're about to get on the helicopter and he just like stops and pauses and he looks back like yeah. you know he's probably yeah. just put his heart soul obviously yeah. spared no expense and it's like you know we got to leave it behind we got to go you know and you can just see it all over his exactly. you know face exactly. and that's, body body you know language that's the moment like yeah <clears throat> for sure yeah yeah, uh, I'll I'll, uh, I'll give the point to Rose on this one again. Definitely like your explanation. And for me, for me, mine is is the the first time where we see the dinosaurs and yeah, it's it's the cameras on Sam Neil and then he taps Laura Dern and then Lord you know grabs her by the head and then you look and then again it's just that 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 panoramic shot of the dinosaurs and again with the, the music kicking in. Yeah. Uh, you know, for me, that's to me, that's the movie right there. And that's uh, my and my most music just swells. Yeah. My most emotional scene. So, uh, yeah, I, I absolutely love that scene. I, that, if I just if I could only watch one scene, I would just watch that one just because, again, if you combine the music and the cinematography on that one, it's just 
again, classic Spielberg Williams combo right there. Right. All right. Rose is on the board, guys. Three, two, one is the current score. Oh, man. Beat in the league. <laughs> oh. uh, okay. All right. The next category we have is Ma the Meatloaf for the funniest or best thing that makes you feel good. So it could be hum mostly, you know, we want to aim for humor on this, but it can also just be a very feel good moment for you, uh, whichever you choose. So Rose, we'll start with you. What do you got? Uh, the, the, your friend's version of Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I think when he's trying to explain, like when, when they're sitting and he's like, you're creating dinosaurs. And he's like, uh, let, let him, let him uh, talk. Mm -hmm. When Hammond says to, um, to your background, let him talk. And he's like, you're creating dinosaurs and, you, and you're and you not uh, seeing what you're doing. But the way that, that, he, that he talks and he's like, bro, You're talking about up. Goldman, I think. Goldman, yeah. Yeah, this guy, it, the, the beginning of the movie, like when they, when they are sitting and he's explaining the plan, and right, everything right, right. and they're sitting and they have the the full uh tvs right, and right, right. he's like uh, were you thinking like you didn't even do anything and you just took ideas from everyone right, and right. made dancers yeah. like mm -hmm. th th there was something that like there's a reason why they were extinct i think that one even if it doesn't make me laugh it's it's just hilarious i, I love it yeah, it's, like the, it's the after the exposition. You know, they've kind of explained yeah, how everything DNA. happens, and then all of a sudden, he's. That's a good scene. That's a great scene. Sure, Pete. What do you got? Uh, my mine is a is a line, or or a back and forth is when when Hammond's like trying to justify, and he's like, you know, but all major theme parks have had delays. You know, when they opened Disneyland in nineteen. Mm -hmm. You know, in 1956, nothing worked. And then Malcolm's like, yeah, but, you know, if the Pirates of the Caribbean breaks down, the Pirates don't eat the tourists. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Loved it. I was cracking up. Nice. Dominique, what do you got? Uh, Ian Malcolm is my favorite character in this film, and he is definitely the funniest. And uh, I like the fact that John Hammond, or, you know, he just doesn't like him. Yeah. And uh, I like the little tiny scene where, you know, he's saying it to the camera, like, hey, are we going to see any dinosaurs? And he's like, God, I hate that man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that one's good. That one's good. Um, yeah, my mine, uh, we've already mentioned it, but it's, you know, the scene, the scene where she's, uh, Laura Dern says, you know, woman inherits the earth. I, I, mm -hmm. I think that's a very, very funny scene again, because she's not necessarily known for her comedy, but their their reaction i think is so comedic and mm -hmm. um but yeah that's an excellent one uh okay for you guys i'm gonna go i'll give dominique the point there i like uh I like, I like that scene all right um okay next we have line please uh again this just maybe your favorite quote underrated line in the film um hopefully not a repeat of anything you've already said but uh, I know what mine is for sure. We'll start with you. Who do we, uh, we'll start with Dominique, yeah. I'm gonna have to go clever girl, Muldoon, mm -hmm. right before he gets attacked by the raptor. Nice. And the other kind of sticks out that's not really like a quote is the when uh, Wayne Knight's character, Nedry, when it's like, uh, 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 you didn't yeah. say the, yeah, the magic word. Because mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that just kind of gets stuck in your head, you know, and he's, yeah, for sure. he's such an obnoxious character. So, yeah. Pete, what do you got? Uh, mine, mine was the one that uh, Dominique said. He's like, uh, now eventually you do plan to have dinosaurs on the <laughs> dinosaur tour, right? <laughs> you know, and he just like, yeah. The way he delivered that line was was so dry, um, yep. but it was it was the absolute number one funniest line in that entire movie. I mean, I love his whole dialogue throughout the entire movie. Uh, his performance is next to flawless, but that line, the way he delivered it, uh, and the yeah. fact that it was in the camera, mm -hmm. you know, was for sure awesome. 
Rose, what do you have? I will go uh, either with Mr. Hammond after careful consideration. I decided not to endorse your park, and so have I. Oh, or um, or the pile of uh, that's a big pile of shit. I think he said that right. <laughs> that's yeah. a big pile of. That's a big pile of shit. Yeah, that one. Nice. Yeah. Again, <laughs> so dry when he delivers a line. It was perfect. That's Mine, great... of course, guys. <laughs> uh, obviously, I gave a huge hint on what my favorite line was going to be, but it's. It's obviously hold on to your butts. Uh, that's just such a good line. And mm-hmm. again, coming from and he says it multiple times. He doesn't just yeah. say it. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give Rose Rose the winner on this one because uh, that that's a great line at the end. Yeah, agree. Especially after everything that just happened, I think that's a like the, the timing of that line. Yeah. Uh, that's a that's a great one. Uh, all right. Give me one the score. It's three to three to two. Mm. So we got ourselves. I have the two red. Okay. Eating now, up now the next the section. Fourth quarter. Yeah. Now it's the fourth quarter now for sure. It's definitely the fourth quarter. Uh, okay. Now uh, we call this section the director's chair. So this is your opportunity. If there, if there's something you can change or would change about this film, what would it be? And I'll start with you, Rose. Oh, this is a difficult one for me because uh, sometimes I'm like, uh, what, what would I do different? But I think, oh my God, you really got me with this one. I actually don't know what would I do different uh, besides maybe um, I think the storytelling as the camera movements and all that is very good, but I would have developed a little bit more uh, the story because it had more potential, but I don't know if I would have done it, right. but actually, yeah. So, and I don't know how, how, because uh, it's not like I'm a Steven Spielberg or, 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 a, or a writer. I always try people to to tell people help me with the writing because I am the worst at creating stories and, and writing them. Like telling them, I, I can help you with that. But but yeah. writing it, I don't know what would I've done different. But I think this the, the story could have been uh, done better. Sure. In in some somehow, but I don't know where. So it's it's such a classic that I'm gonna let the people. Judge by themselves and <laughs> get into any trouble there. No, well, yeah. I, mean, I, I I can actually kind of agree with you that I don't, you know, typically there'd be something very specific. I think the only thing I would change, we talked about it earlier, is the line. There's the line about the the lilac. Like there's just some, like, there, there, for like for me, there's there's two kind of parts. There's that, that hey, we have poison, we put poisonous things here. We know they don't eat them, but we're just going to put them. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, it's just, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I, maybe they're trying to show the arrogance of the, you know, the the staff and all that, but it, I don't know. It, to me, it maybe just goes a little too far where it's just like, that's just one of the, the, the worst reasons I've ever heard in my life. Um, but again, maybe time, that's, though, you, maybe you that's needed, the point. You needed examples of of their their haste in, sure. in trying to open this park and overlooking very key moments. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, don't I, know. Know. I, never, this I is, never had a problem with them. And, and, the, and the other part is uh, uh, BD, BD Wong, I think is his name. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, they, there's another question where they kind of question him. And, and he just kind of acts like, a, like, what could go wrong? Or I don't know. Just again, they kind of make this, this brilliant scientist make him really obtuse. And I, I just. Well, they make him kind of a dick. Like the right. way he responds to people, like these guys are guests, right? Uh, who have to sign off on this park, treat them well, and yet he's what too cool for school, and he just sits there and like. Yeah, I would have, I would have, re- I would have preferred the character have been more, like, had a passion for like dinosaurs and or like, kind of like sold the argument of why what they're doing is so important versus like you're saying made him kind of a dick and then like you know, just, and he also, again, he, he just seemed like, oh, this is just the perfect plan. Nothing could go wrong. And it's just, I don't know. I, I just didn't really buy that. 
And I, I, th I said, I think it would have been stronger if they would have made him be the advocate for why what they're doing, like their why their research is so critical. And maybe even through an explanation of like, look, I know this is just about dinosaurs, but think about what we could do, boom, here and maybe translate to human. And again, just kind of have that other side of the argument, because that's what, what always makes great movies is when you have two different arguments and they both make such a great argument, and you're just like, ah, yeah, I mean, I get your point. But I'll just get your point. And just, again, it makes that kind of moral decision, the moral debate a little bit stronger. I would have used that character to, again, been more besides Hammond, but actually have one of the scientists be just, again, absolutely in love with what they're doing and, and convince the audience why this is a great idea. You know what I mean? Mm, yeah. I guess but, so. Again, they, uh, nitpicking, I agree kind of ultimately with Rose. I, I, I think they, they, they did a really good job overall and there's not, there's not really anything hard I would change besides again, maybe those, but I'm just kind of more spitballing, but all right, Pete, go for you. Uh, for me, not a lot I would change. Um, I would maybe recast Timmy. I, he, he bugged me the whole time. I, I, he was, just, he was annoying. I didn't like his face and he just bothered me the entire movie. Every time he, would, he was on the screen, I get angry. Would you say, would you, would you punch him, Pete? Would you, would you go that far? Does he have a punchable face? <laughs> I, I might strike him with an open hand, perhaps. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's good. Well, at least we're not advocating child abuse on this. That's good. Right. Oh, no, right. never. Never. All right. Dominique. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't stay, change anything in, this, in the story or the directing or music or anything like that. I just think just parts like characters, like I hated to see Sam Jackson's character die. Yeah. Which kind of made it out. Like, I wish he would have survived. Like, yeah, I agree. Like he would have had more of a hero role or like turned everything on and then died. Do you know what I mean? Like kind of yeah. like that character like you know hero role at the end um and then it's funny you brought up bd wong because um i kind of wish he had been in it more or longer or kind of hung around the island and not left i think he would have been he would have added in the scientist role you know throughout like the survival yeah. mode of everything and maybe he would have had something to offer or you know yeah. just been a little bit more part of the story because he does come back later in some of the other movies right, right. and so i would like to have seen him a little bit more in the first yeah, I, I would agree with that. That's a good. Uh, that's a good one. Um, I awesome. just it up. Yeah, I think uh, Dominic can give you the point. Yeah. Thank you. That was a good, good little. Mm. It's three. It's three to three to three. Then no, she no three to four. I two. took the lead. Yeah, she just took the lead, Pete. Wow. Well we got done. one. One remaining. Thank you. We got one remaining category left. Good job, you big jerk. Uh, couple other. <laughs> uh, couple other. Did you knows? Um, so every time I watch a film, I love going through like IMDb and just looking through some of the trivia stuff. Cause there's always just really cool, um, you know, stuff about the film. So I'm a big fan of that. So I, I'll, I'll just read a couple. I'm not going to read all of them, but, uh, uh the T-Rex, yeah. the, yeah, the T-Rex occasionally malfunctioned due to rain. Uh, oh. Kathleen Kennedy, the, the producer recalls the T-Rex went into the heebie-jeebies sometimes scared the crap out of us. We'd be like eating lunch and all of a sudden the T-Rex would come alive. Oh. At first we didn't know what was happening. Then we realized it was the rain. You'd hear people start screaming. But that one just <laughs> cracks me up. I can imagine just, you know, you're yeah, eating, that's good. eating lunch. <laughs> how, many, how many underpants had to be changed on set? Yeah. Right. That would have been awesome. Uh, Michael Crichton intended John Hammond to be a dark Walt Disney. thought that was interesting. Uh Oh, this one's this one's a popular one. Michael Crichton was asked why the novel has Jurassic in the title, even though all the dinosaurs are from the Cretaceous period. Yeah, uh, he replied um, that it never occurred actually, to him. Actually, they're from the Cretaceous period. Yeah, yeah. he's like it never, <laughs> yeah. never occurred to him, and Shut admitted up. it was just the best looking design. So Word. you know, yeah, it's uh, Cretaceous, Cretaceous Park, Park just does the same ring. Yeah, best, so. yeah no. we're, we're gonna go with Michael Crichton on this one. Actually. Actually, lilacs are really kind of uh, poisonous to dinosaurs. I don't know why you would put them in the movie. <laughs> um, oh, um, so Malcolm and uh, uh, Jeff Goldblum and Laura Dern uh, ended up having uh, a romantic relationship after this movie. thought that was kind of interesting. Hmm. Uh, I think they dated for two years or something like that. Yeah. Oh, they were engaged for two years before breaking up. And... Uh, despite being called Jurassic Park, dinosaurs only have about 15 minutes of screen time, which is kind of crazy. And that, is, that, that 
apparently oh. that was um one like you know that was a big critique on this entire film i actually don't think that's a good critique because i think it's perfect for especially for the first one i think it's perfect the amount of time because it, it just again it leaves the intrigue the suspense the whole nine i will say speaking of the dinosaurs mm -hmm. that was this is one of my favorite aspects of this film is that you know if you go back and watch the original trailer all they show is t-rex right they don't show the raptors at all but as you're watching this movie from start to finish the beginning you see a, a raptor fossil you see the the hook that he uses when he's scaring that kid right. they talk about the raptors so much throughout this movie but they only show the t-rex up through the first two acts of this film right. the third act is all about the raptors and they've been right. lead, and they've been building up to the raptors the entire time and so then that whole third act is all raptors all the time yeah but it's always made out that the t-rex is like the big scary one and meanwhile the t-rex becomes the hero at the end right it's right like, and now and that was like also one of, that's also one of the fun facts is crazy that actually wasn't in the original ending so the original ending had the the skeleton of the t-rex falling on the raptors and killing them and then spielberg just ultimately sensed that that wasn't it was working too easy. yeah and then he, yeah, he was just, just like this fall on him and he always considered the t-rex as the hero of this and so that's why the t-rex comes in like you're saying at the end and saves the day because like you're saying at the end of the day the t-rex is what this film is about it, it is the main character if you really kind of Think about it because all the other characters really there's not a, a main protagonist that's it, it, going back to probably rose's original point that's probably the biggest flaw is this flaw of this is i mean grant is maybe technically the protagonist or it, it could be hammond but again it's 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 really am ambiguous which is not common for a film like this to really not have a legitimate protagonist but um yeah i thought that was interesting Honestly, guys, there's so much research on this. Go on IDB, check out the Did You Know. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff just on the animatronic stuff, like all that stuff. So I would recommend everybody taking a look at that. Um, okay. And so this leads to our final category, which so David Kep is the writer. He took over for Michael Crichton. And a lot of people may not know David Kep by name. But his body of work, you probably most likely do know. And he has a lot of excellent films that he's written that have been iconic and that have, uh, you know, been a big part of our American cinema. And so we'll start with you, Dominique. What are your top five David Kep scripts? So I will scripts, preface not by movies. Saying... Remember, scripts, not movies. So yeah. purely script. Okay. So I have not seen a lot of his films so okay. i chose again okay. from ones that i've seen and enjoyed uh and coming in at number five i'm gonna go angels and demons i really enjoyed the da vinci code that yeah. was very smart um you know just really well done uh number four spider-man yeah number three the original the original, the original that's correct number three the original mission impossible came out i believe in 1996 mm -hmm. um, number two one of my all-time favorite films, Carlito's Way with Al Pacino. Mm -hmm. And coming in at number one, why we're all here this evening, Jurassic Park. Good list. Good list. Thank you. Peter, oh, what no. do you got? The dinosaur got her. Oh, she's back. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, what do you got? Uh, my list is a, a perfect list, and it follows as such. Uh, number five for me is 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 near and dear to my childhood, and it's Toy Soldiers. It was a it was a great it was your classic early '90s action movie, uh, but set with a bunch of like teenagers, and one of them was Sean Austin, who I loved from Goonies, and this was the first time I saw him yeah. when he was grown well grown up more. Um, and I thought it was clever. I thought it was fun, and it was awesome. Yeah. Uh, number four for me is a very underappreciated movie, but the script was really great, which was Secret Window with mm. Johnny Depp. And I, I thought it was clever. Uh, number three, I had to put the Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. Number two, I put Jurassic Park. And the only reason why I didn't make it number one, only because the the bulk of the material was already kind of written for him. Uh, so I had, to, I had to make Mission Impossible number one because 
the way that that story was told, the way the movie presented itself, you were guessing all the way until the very end. And that starts yeah. with the writing. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That's a good list. Rose, what do you got? Thank you. Flawless. I have top three because I don't know a lot of his movies and they were already mentioned here. But for me, the number three is the um, Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. uh, then two, Spider-Man. And the first one for me is uh, Mission Impossible. I also think that the intriguing and, and all that. Nowadays, it's really difficult to, to surprise us uh, as filmmakers also and a lot of people uh, with what's coming, what's coming. A lot of people are like, oh, yeah, he's a bad guy or oh, this is going to happen. And it happens a lot. Yeah. So for a movie to have that uh, ability, I think it's it's amazing. So I just have three because I don't know a lot about him and okay. shame on me, but That's yeah. Okay. So I'll give you my five list and I've, I've got a couple sleepers. Number five for me is a movie with Kevin Bacon called Stir of Echoes. I'm not a big kind of horror guy, but this is one of the, uh, this is a film that just, it, it kind of just terrified me. And it's just such a just such an intriguing kind of script. And Kevin Bacon's just so uneasy the whole movie. But I, I really enjoyed the script. Again, not typically a movie I'd watch. I, I forgot how I even stumbled upon it, but I watched it and I was just super blown away. I've seen it several times now and might even check it out soon. Again, that's a great movie. Hmm. Uh, number four, the original Spider-Man. Uh, for again, we hadn't it. it for, I thought it was a really good script for a comic book film. And, you know, again, this is like the beginning of comic book from this literally probably the besides batman i guess but this is the usher, ushering in this new era number three jurassic park <clears throat> again i i think I, it, it's a better movie than it is script um and it's probably even a better book than it is script but i think still he did a great job with the script for from from what the material was uh so i don't want to definitely take away from that um it's still a great script but um more of a great film with all the other elements uh, and then number two, I kind of agree with Pete in terms of, I think Mission Impossible is probably the number one overall script, if I'm just doing pure script, but my number one is Toy Soldiers, only because uh, I love that film, and it's it's just such a different film than... We watched it all the time. All the time. <laughs> I just watched it not that long ago, but it's just such a different film, and, you know, it, 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 it's so clever with what how the film unfolds and in like how they basically try and go up against these terrorists. And, you know, if you guys haven't seen that, it's highly, highly recommend it. ridiculous, but it's really well done. I haven't it's seen it. Is it kind of like a war games, like that kind of, or? Yeah. No, yeah. It's like, yeah. A, it's like a, a, an academy that they send boys who are, they don't behave very good. Okay. Um, it's kind of like a die hard, it's like a die hard meets, you know, Dead uh, Poet Society. Dead Poet Society, yeah. It's oh, a, wow, that's a big meet. It's, okay. uh, it's it's a different film. Like I said, there's not really nothing like this. So it's I'm gonna have to check that out. Yeah, it's really entertaining. So uh yeah. So I am gonna give the award to Pete Dog. Yeah, on this one. Only because he had toy soldiers. Sure. And so I think All we right, have baby. a tie. I think we have a tie with Pete and Dominique. Oh, what's the oh, tie right there? Unfortunately, Rose, you did <laughs> not. I, I, I both for the tiebreaker. Breaker. You have to have two votes, mine and Paul's. Uh, okay, okay, that, that seems yes. fair. So, so Rose, I, I, out of Dominic and Pete, who do you think won? You're the tiebreaker. Oh my God, that's so fair. <laughs> I thought you were going to do another question. No, this going was to suggestion. Oh, I don't have another, I don't have another category. This was your suggestion. You're the tiebreaker. And remember, oh, my, remember my strong stance on empowered female roles and all that other kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, just, come on. Go but I'm going to go with it. Here, because I'm, I'm, I'm going to choose the best part. Go ahead. Wait, you're gonna what? Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, you you go. You were gonna choose. Yeah, you choose. Oh, I'm just gonna go with our new guest, Dominique. Pete, you, oh, you've yay! already won. You've already won several films, and so we want to. I want to give someone someone new. 
but you guys are hey, both winners and today. The reason, you guys are both you. winners today. So Dominic, and the reason I'm giving it to Dominic is because of the sound. I think that was one you. of the questions, and I would have wanted to answer that. So yeah, for me, the sound in that movie, it's amazing. Yeah, so, it sounds crazy. I'm sorry, Pete. I, I would have voted for you. But <laughs> All right. Well, have- thank you both for being here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Dominique, as winner of today's podcast, what film would you like us to review? It's not necessarily going to be next, but what? Sure. Are we going classic? Classic, yeah. I'm going to go Back to the Future if it's not already been done. Oh my God. I oh, was yes. going to say that. I was going to say Are you really? That. Yeah. Nice. Beautiful. I would have told my favorite movie. You both win. There you go. I, was, I also was going to say that. <laughs> All right, Rose. There we go. Well done. Awesome. So, yeah, Back to the Future will be on the list, and, and that is on the list. So, that works out well for everybody. So, awesome. well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. I had a blast. Thanks for having me. This yeah. is so much fun. I would love to come back if invited. Let Absolutely. me know. We'll do this again. Uh, definitely enjoyed everybody here. And uh, check out, we'll have an, we have another podcast. If you haven't already checked out our first three episodes, uh, check those out. We, have, we did Top Gun. We did the Top Gun Maverick review. We did uh, Crimes of the Future and <sighs> Weekly News. Don't go see that, that one. That was that don't one. see that movie. Just based on title alone. I'm Horrible. Like, <laughs> Horrible. That one's, that one's a that one's a different movie. Rose, that movie's not for you. Don't watch that movie. <laughs> that, movie. <laughs> that movie is not for you. But uh, <laughs> yeah, and then um, we have I know we have an Indiana Jones one coming up that's already been shot, so that will be Love getting it. released soon. And then we'll have our Jurassic Park, uh, I'm sorry, Jurassic World Dominion review coming out as well. We'll be watching that uh, Thursday night and then uh, shooting a podcast on that shortly. So. Yeah, thank you again. Make sure you, uh, our, our fans, make sure you subscribe and share and help spread the word and let's get, help this thing grow and we'll, we'll talk more movies, talk more films and all the, everything related and uh, help this thing grow, guys. So thanks again. All right, thank, thank you. Bye, guys.